Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, students, staff, supporters. It's great to welcome you here. Um, <clears throat> I'm proud as president and vice chancellor of this wonderful university to that we now have our inaugural lecture series well underway and you're gonna hear a wonderful lecture this evening. In welcoming you, I, I want to show my respect um, by acknowledging the Bejigal people, the traditional custodians of this land, and also pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres, Island, Torres Strait Islanders who are here with us today. Um, these lectures are intended to do all sorts of things. They, they are a celebration of the achievements of our new professors. They're an opportunity to hear our new professors talk about their work, but not only about their work. They're, they're, the, the hope is that they will talk about their work in an accessible way. So it doesn't matter whether you're from engineering or from medicine or from the arts or whatever part of the university, or if you're not from the university at all, that you can, can understand something about it. But more than that, they're, they're an opportunity for our, our successful professors to talk about their lives, their careers, their mentors, and, and what's motivated them to join their careers. And over and above that, they're a great occasion for networking because we will have a reception afterwards to which you're all invited. And I, I just want to get the ball rolling by telling you a bit about Sean Smith. As you'd expect for someone who is a professor at UNSW, he has a very long CV. Um, he also has a very international CV. He's done all sorts of things. He started off, he was born in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. He um, got a BSc Honours at the University of Canterbury. He got a PhD in Theoretical Chemistry at the University of Canterbury. And that's just been the start of an amazing career. He had an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship at the University of Göttingen. He was a visiting postdoctoral research fellow at the University of uh, Berkeley, University of California. He held a faculty position. He then made the wise move of coming to work in Australia and uh, held a faculty position at the University of Queensland in 1993. Now, I don't know exactly where in that mix, May, yes, I do know actually, Mayen, he met May and his wife um, in Germany, I think, on that fellowship in Germany. Um, and they together decided that they'd come to Australia. And of course, they, they've definitely made Australia their, their permanent home now. And it's great that Mayen is here this evening, along <coughs> with their two children, Ralph and Ethan. And um, I'm going to embarrass Ralph because it's Ralph's 15th birthday today. And I won't. I won't make everyone. I won't make everyone sing happy birthday now, but we might just embarrass him further by doing it a bit later. Um, this is not Sean's first professorial appointment. He became a professor and director of the Centre for Computational Molecular Science at the University of Queensland as long ago as 2002, but he's never before had an inaugural lecture. In 2006, his lab moved to the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology at the University of Queensland. He worked with colleagues in the ARC Centre of Excellence for Functional Nanomaterials from 2002 to 2011 as program leader and deputy director. And finally, he made the best move of his career um, in, um, in, in moving to, um, to UNSW Australia in 2014. But before doing that, he spent another period of time overseas as director of the US Department of Energy a, in the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's one of five major centers in the US. But in 2014, he joined the School of Chemical Engineering at UNSW Australia, and we're really glad to have him here. Glad to have him here because he is a, a top quality scientist. He's published over 230 referee journal in. 230 articles in refereed journals. He has an age index of 44. He's, he's supervised 12 completed PhD studentships. His research, which you'll hear about, involves theoretical and computational studies of chemical kinetics, reaction dynamics, catalysis, um, self-assembly and transport phenomena within nanomaterials, proteins, and hybrid 
nanobio systems, and I'm sure he'll explain it a lot better to his talk than I just did. He has enormous amounts of research funding, total in Australia, 10.9 um, million dollars. In the US, he had 42 million dollars, and that comes from um, industry partners like Procter & Gamble, as well as from uh, research funding agencies like the Australian Research Council. He has lots and lots of awards, and I better not read them all out because I might take up far too much time, but I will just say that his career started out really well in New Zealand, where he, he got the best graduate student paper um, at the uh, New Zealand Institute of Chemistry National Conference in Auckland in 1987, and the best graduate student paper again in Warburton, Victoria in 1988. So there were, there were great, there were signs of great things to come. Um, there's the Alexander von Holbach Research Fellowship. He's an elected fellow of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. Uh, he got the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Research Award from Germany. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and it goes on and on. There's one other important aspect of his work that I want to emphasize, and, um, and that is that he's always been very keen on the interaction between theory and experiment, and he, he's always taken the view that progress towards new functional materials can only be made through the, the synergistic interaction between those things. He's also um, been on the editorial and advisory boards for a number of journals in physical chemistry and chemical kinetics, and he has two patents. I better stop there. Uh, I could go on a lot longer. It's a, it's a wonderful CV. It's great to celebrate um, Sean's inaugural lecture, and we're now going to hear his lecture, um, Powering Materials Discovery, an integrative, an integrative Approach to Computational Materials Science and Engineering. Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian, for the very kind uh, introduction and warm words. Um, and thank you for instituting this um, uh, wonderful tradition of inaugural lectures. I think it's a great development. It's a pleasure. Thank you all for coming. A pleasure to be here. I'm going to tell you something about uh, some of the research I've done over the years, a little bit of history as well, where I've been and so forth, um, and hopefully a, a couple of points here and there about philosophy and strategic things that I think are merit consideration. So without further ado, let's proceed. Um, start at the start. This is early days uh, in Christchurch where I grew up for the most part. Um, I actually had a chance to go back across there for actually for a funeral earlier this year. And I walked over to the place we used to live. So the, the color photos there are, are, are new photos taken earlier this year of the place we used to live in about 35 years ago, Carbine Place, and the school I went to, St. Thomas of Canterbury College. Uh, this is my mum and dad from back when I was about 10-ish or something like that. Um, and then this was my um, principal, school principal, and my chemistry teacher in year 12, Henry Shepard, a wonderful man and a wonderful mentor. And I'm still a chemist or a chemical engineer, depending which way you look at me. Um, so there we are. He did something right, didn't he? Um, so uh, in those days, you know, coming from where I came from, and I, I got a sense of this also when I heard Darren Bagnell's talk um, a month or so back, you know, we, no one in our families went to university before, and so we didn't think too much about where we were going to go. It wasn't a great plan. I cycled a few minutes around the road to my school, and then when I got my scholarship and left high school, I cycled 15 minutes down the road to the local university, University of Canterbury. Um, no more thinking really went into it. Uh, it's, a con it's a much more complex world these days, obviously. But um, there I was in the chemistry school, and I was lucky because University of Canterbury has not a half-bad chemistry department and also got a pretty good chem school as well. And I got interested in my undergraduate degree in chemical kinetics uh, because I had teachers like Murray McEwen uh, who were doing very interesting experimental um, uh, chemical kinetics studies. And in my last year, uh, this bloke called Bob Gilbert came across from Sydney to visit for a month and gave us lectures about theory of chemical kinetics. Um, and Bob is here today in the audience. Thank you, Bob, for coming. I'm honored and very grateful. Um, and I was blown away, just absolutely mesmerized uh, by, by Bob's lectures and the fact that you could start from simple principles like Newton's equations, which even I understood as a, as a student, 
And from that, you could build up and actually use pure theory to predict the real reaction rate. To me, it was amazing. Um, and so I was enthusiastic, and Bob and Murray talked up a project between them. They were interested to work together. And thus, the, the, the PhD project was born. Um, I realized about 18 months into my project that, that Bob and uh, Murray were talking across purposes like this, and they really didn't have too much idea what each other was saying. But it's all good, because that's what a student's supposed to do, figure your way through it, right? And so they were both fine scientists, and I enjoyed the project very much, and it was successful. Um, so uh, there we are with the Christchurch stuff. Um, oh, one more thing I was going to say. This was my office as a student up here, top of the building. And um, that's roughly where it is in the city of Christchurch. This is an aerial view looking across to the mountains. Um, uh, and that was my view from the office, right? That to this day, that's still the most fabulous office view I've ever had, and I will never have a view like that again. So there are some good things about studying in, in Canterbury, I should say. Okay, so I finished my PhD. I went off to Germany, had a Humboldt Fellowship uh, together with uh, Jürgen Thor and the Physical Chemistry Institute in Göttingen, uh, and extended and developed further the kind of work I was doing. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute. Um, and then I met this lovely lady here down in the corner, Zhang Mei Yun, um, immediately fell head, head over heels in love and decided that we were uh, going to stay together after a short while. Um, and so um, things went on and, and, and uh, uh, we figured we we're going to stick together. And I said to Mei Yun, um, you know, next year we got a chance to move to Berkeley. We're going to work with Bradley Moore at UC Berkeley. How exciting is that? She said, oh. That's exciting. I just spent a year learning German. I moved myself from Taiwan to Germany to do my master's, and we're going to Berkeley. Oh, good. <laughs> so, um, you know, Mayun has remade herself from undergraduate studies in Chinese literature to um, um, international marketing of computer components in Taiwan, uh, to studies uh, in Germany and sociology, um, then to studies of linguistics in Brisbane as we moved ultimately to Brisbane three or four times over, completely remade herself professionally because of the way I was going and where I was heading, for which I have tremendous gratitude and, and tremendous respect. You'll see a few things relating to that on the way through. Um, so there we are. Now, I said to my mates in the lab and in, uh, in getting in after a little while that I was going to get engaged and married, um, and they said to me, weißt du schon, du musst erst den Chef seine Erlaubnis bieten which is my vague recollection of German as to, don't you know you've got to ask your boss's permission to do this? And I said, what? <laughs> so, so I duly rocked up to Jürgen's office and asked the Herr Professor Doctor his permission to get engaged. <laughs> um, and he, um, you know, he nodded wisely and gave me a few words of sage advice and with tongue in cheek gave me his blessing. Um, so that's a, that's a tradition which probably would not translate quite so easily to the Australian context. But anyway, there we are. And there are some other interesting traditions, if I may err on the light side, uh, in Göttingen as well, which in this case relate to this lovely lady up in the top there, the Ganser Liesel, a lovely brass statue, um, an elegant brass statue down by the town hall in the old city. And so when they get their PhD, the graduate is wheeled on down to the uh, town hall in these wagons they knock up from bicycle wheels and anything else they can find, and they have to climb up and kiss the Ganser Liesel. And then they get wheeled back by their buddies to the institute. They have a riotous party and wake up with a huge headache the next day in true Germanic fashion. Um, so they have some lovely traditions there, and it was an enjoyable time. OK, what did I do when I was uh, a student and a, and a young early career person? It all had to do with chemical kinetics and predicting reaction rates. And so if I can try to summarize uh, very briefly, what the idea is, if you have a, we're going to have a chemical reaction, you've got a couple of reactants coming together, they start to feel each other electronically, they interact, you start to break one bond, you start to make another one, and then they slide apart and you get products, stable products, all right? And so in the middle there, you've got one bond half broken and one bond half made, and it's naturally a high energy state, a so-called transition state. And that's kind of what is the, the rate determining bottleneck for the whole process, okay? And so you can calculate uh, the electronic potential energy as you go from one side up over the hill to the other side. Um, and if you look top down, you get an elevation map, and you can see this really is where the barrier is, and that's the rate-determining position. 
Uh, and so if we treat the system classically, Newton's equations, start, you know, start things out with initial velocities and so on, let them roll, you can trace the way they go as a trajectory and they either reflect back or they go over the barrier and shoot through the products, right? And so since this is the rate determining place, if we can put a dividing surface in like that, we can count and we can estimate the flux going across that surface. Well, if it gets up there, it's probably going to keep on going. That's the transition state assumption. If you make it to the top, you're probably going to go over and not come back again. And so it all comes down to evaluating fluxes. We've got some dividing surface at the barrier. We need to integrate over that surface and evaluate the reaction flux of, tra of trajectories going through. If I can get that, I divide by reactant population. I've got a rate constant, and then I can track the kinetics. So that's what it was all about. Typical reaction we might have looked at is this sort of thing here, small organic molecule falling apart or recombining, depending which way you go. Um, and the stiff vibrations in here have to be treated quantum mechanically. Uh, and so we do that as discrete state counting. But then these loose rotational modes of the fragments and the orbital movement of these things, all very loose modes. And so we can treat them classically and you get this kind of integral business going on. So you've got all these uh, Euler angles for rotation and orbiting degrees of freedom and their momenta, and you have to integrate over the dividing surface, about 16-dimensional integral, um, which takes a little while when you've got to do it many thousands of times over to get the overall rate. And so in those early days, I set myself the challenge that I was going to figure out how to knock off all these momentum integrals analytically, and I could easily integrate three of the overall angles and left with just a little five-dimensional integral, which is way, way faster and easier to do. And so over a period of about 10 years, in about three or four seminal papers, I figured out how to do it. Um, it took a while, but we got there. And so that's what I sp spent my time doing in those early days. Um, if you have to treat these things quantum mechanically, then you don't have Newton's equations. You've got wave packets, which describe the wave-like motion of the atoms, all right? And as a simple illustration, little one-dimensional case here, um, here's a wave packet representing an incoming system impinging on the barrier there. Um, you move through time, 30 femtoseconds, it's approaching the barrier. 50 femtoseconds, it's interacting with the barrier. You s start to see it separating, and after 100 odd femtoseconds, you can see what didn't react and what did react. And you interrogate the amplitudes and figure out what the reaction rate was that way. So um, you can do this not just in one dimensional, in multi dimensions. And um, this is basically how we propagate wave packets and describe reactions quantum mechanically. Um, <clears throat> So I won't go into too much more detail, except to say that the innovation we built up over a number of years, um, and I was inspired to get into this game because I was interacting with Bill Miller's team at Berkeley, a uh, wonderful guy, a great mentor, um, was uh, that the most expensive operation in propagating a wave packet is the matrix vector multiply, um, because it's a dense matrix. It's a huge matrix, millions and millions of elements. Um, such that you can't actually store this thing. You just got to evaluate the elements on the fly as you do the multiply. Um, and the idea naively was, what if I could transform this, transform the representation and make it tridiagonal? Then the propagation's utterly trivial because I'm just multiplying three elements. Uh, easy to do. And there's a very established way to do it, numerically the Lanchos algorithm, which traditionally was used to compute eigenvalues of large matrices. Um, and we showed basically how to extend that algorithm to do full quantum scattering to extract all the product state distributions and so on and so forth um, in a very memory and, and time efficient way uh, that had not been done before. So we did reaction kinetics of different types. I'm just going to skip on through this in view of time. Um, and that's what I did in the early stage of my career, first decade or so uh, after I finished my PhD. I wanted to acknowledge uh, my early career mentors because in many ways they're the most important. Bob, uh, obviously, Bradley Moore at Berkeley, um, this is a later photo, obviously, that we took. Uh, um, Jürgen Poor in Göttingen, uh, Dave Golden at Stanford SRI in Palo Alto, Mike Pilling at Leeds, Bill Miller at Berkeley, and Yuan Lee at Berkeley. Later, he returned to Taiwan after he had his Nobel Prize. Um, so, a pop quiz, and Bob Gilbert, Scott Cable, Timothy Schmidt, be quiet. It's too easy for you guys. Um, what's the deal with this cup that everybody's drinking out of here? Can anybody tell me what that is? We've got Brits in the audience who know this one? Well, that's what's in it, but what is it is the question. This is the so-called loving cup of the Faraday division of the Royal Society. And they have a wonderful uh, tradition. They have these Faraday discussion meetings, which are a truly unique format. 
And then at the end of the meeting, they have a dinner, and the participants, which are a select group, like Gordon conferences sort of thing, um, drink from the loving cup and pass it around and toast the Faraday division. So another nice little uh, tradition from, from the UK there. Okay, this is my, then uh, my first kind of uh, philosophical point I wanted to make to you as a short interregnum to the science. Uh, graduate education and early career development, a challenge for the Australian system. Um, when I finished my PhD and I went across to Germany, I was young, I was ego-driven, you know, I was right on top of my game, and I thought I was the best at it, right? And I was the best at what I did. But when you're young and ego-driven and, and you come out of the antipodes, it takes a few years for it to sink in that, yes, you are very good at what you do, but really you don't know very much about anything else. Um, and I think this is the weakness of our Australian system, quite frankly. We have compressed PhDs. We have no graduate coursework. Um, and so our students... And we're, we're a geographically dispersed community. We have great expertise, but generally it's spread around. Um, I would say photovoltaics here at UNSW is one of the very rare exceptions where you have truly a critical mass in that space. But generally, we're spread around, OK? And so um, when our graduates go overseas, they do suffer in comparison with graduates from the major universities in the US and Europe who simply know a lot more, in a broader sense, around their specific project areas. Uh, because they've had that exposure, which we don't get for the most part. Um, and I think it's a challenge to figure what can we do to try and treat us, uh, to try and prepare our students better for the big world out there. Um, I did see evidence of this when I was at Oak Ridge, and I wanted to uh, share with you one thing I saw. And this is one of the examples of Mayin remaking herself after finishing her masters and PhDs in linguistics at UQ and ANU. Um, I said, hey, honey, I got this great job at Oak Ridge. We're moving to Oak Ridge. Oh, that's good. Um, so Oak Ridge doesn't do arts. They only do science and engineering. Uh, and so what May In did was picked up a role where she was building liaison programs between neutron sciences at Oak Ridge and the university sector. And what she figured out pretty quickly was that neutron sciences is a bit similar to what I've been telling you. It's a boutique subject. And so you don't get a critical mass in that subject in any one institution. It's spread all over the place. And if you're going to teach a graduate level course, you're going to spend a whole lot of time and you're going to teach, what, three or four students? It's not, it just doesn't make sense. And so you need a mechanism for being able to deliver a comprehensive graduate level education to the whole community, spread around the whole country and around the whole world. And so what she did was started up an initiative to build a cyber enabled graduate course, comprehensive graduate course in neutron scattering. And she went out and engaged initially an organizing committee, um, the leading lights in the game, and then went out and engaged the leading professors across the country and persuaded them that this was a good deal for them to be involved in. They only have to spend a little bit of time and their students get access to all that expertise from all their colleagues across the country. Money for nothing. And they all came in. It says, this is the who's who of neutron scattering did two courses, one in soft matter, one in condensed matter for neutron scattering. And so I think there are seeds in there of something we could think about in the Australian context. Um, it's multi-institutional. It's not going to be UNSW-centric because then you'll run into institutional competitiveness. Uh, but I think there are seeds of things that we could potentially do to enhance the education uh, for our graduates. It's not a MOOC either, by the way. It's not intended to be introductory stuff at a low level with thousands of enrollments. It's the intellectual high ground comprehensive graduate level education to broaden the st intellectual strength of our, of our graduates. OK, let's come back to uh, University of Queensland. Uh, I went there in 1993 and um, started out in theoretical chemistry, as I've told you. Uh, grew up academically there in chemistry. Uh, in 2005, as Ian mentioned, I moved my lab and started up a computational lab in the Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology uh, at UQ. Um, how did I switch from doing this stuff uh, on the board to bioengineering and nanotech? Uh, I did it through the, through the benefit of setting up this multidisciplinary computational chemistry center at UQ, supported by the uh, vision and uh, wisdom of the likes of Paul Greenfield and John Hay at the time. Um, and so the idea was to go from chemistry, reach out to our colleagues in engineering, in biology and so forth, and build genuine cross-disciplinary applications of molecular simulations, which we duly did. Um, uh, in her spare time while she was finishing her PhD, Mayin also set up all the infrastructure here for me, so I just focused on the science and the programs, which helped things to move along well. 
Um, I'll come back to science now. I want to talk about a couple of things that we did in those days um, which are still germane and still very important to what we're doing here at UNSW. Uh, the first one is a cellular de delivery of genetic material into cells. Uh, I don't, anybody from biology knows it way, way better than I do, but let me quickly summarize. You want to do this if, for example, you want to do permanent modification of plant genes to make them more resistant to diseases or more resistant to harsh climatic conditions or whatever. Uh, you want to do it um, for biomanufacturing of, of uh, uh, drugs, which are proteins, protein drugs. You put lots of the DNA into your E. coli or your CHO cells and use them as little biofactories to make lots of the drug protein that you want to then harvest. Or uh, gene therapy, if you use short-strand RNA, uh, you can use that and get it into patients, and it's a way of mediating harmful um, disease-related protein transfection uh, processes that build up in neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, the so-called protein fibr fibrillation, where you get these clumps of proteins that cause trouble and then degenerate the, the neural behavior. So the RNA gets in there and basically messes with that disease-related mechanism, and, and it rectifies the behavior of the neural cells. Um, so lots of my colleagues at UQ and everywhere uh, have all got their own platform for delivering RNA and drugs and genes into cells, for good reason. It's a very important topic. But when you look at their data, and we used to sit down as group leaders and look at all this data about delivery, and this works and that doesn't, and we don't know why, it's the jungle out there. There's so much data and so little mechanistic understanding of why, what works, and what doesn't. You find something that works, you just follow it up and tweak it and see if you can go further. Um, and so we thought, as humble molecular simulation guys, let's start at the bottom and try and shed a little bit of light uh, uh, that'll help, ideally help us to move forwards with rational understanding. And so we started to work on simulation of the complexes between your delivery uh, molecules, which are typically liposomes, polymers, or dendromers, uh, with the, in our case, short-strand RNA, you could do it with drugs as well, obviously, and get it into the cell. The issue being, oh, and, and these are the little dendromers that my colleague Harry Parekh at Pharmacy was building. Ouyang Defang was a student who worked between us. He learned how to make these things and how to simulate them. Um, and, you know, the deal is that your RNA is, is uh, negatively charged, and you need to envelop it in something that will give it a positive external zeta potential so it can nestle up to the cell wall and get in through endocytosis. And people use polymers, as I said. They use inorganic particles. They use dendromers and so forth, all positively charged in order to cluster this thing around and help it get into the cell. So we started with one, and we looked at the interaction of this with a particular cervical cancer-related RNA strand. Um, and uh, you, know, you can follow it in time, run your simulation, and you see how it gets in and nestles into the major groove of the RNA and sticks there for quite a long time because it's electrostatic attraction holding them together. Um, to get closer to experiment, you want to do this, which is load up lots of these little guys and see how they really cluster around the RNA. You can work out average binding energies, the average coverage ratio uh, of these things, and learn intuitive stuff that can help the experimentalists to take the next step in designing their carrier particles to get it into the cell. It's all very much early phase exploratory work, um, but I think it's a step in the right direction and an important one which we're now picking up and pursuing uh, with our colleagues here at UNSW and at UQ. Um, change gear here, hydrogen storage. So um, all of our cars in within about 20, maybe 30 years, I would say, are going to have to run on hydrogen or run on batteries, or a hybrid of both. They can't continue to run on gasoline for reasons that everybody would be well aware of. So if you're talking about hydrogen, cars which will run on a fuel cell with hydrogen, we need to move from, whoops, I'm sorry, we need to move from this little guy to the real thing. Um, and that means you've got to have something in your tank which you're going to pump the hydrogen into, OK? Now, we can't use compressed gas cylinders because they explode. That's no good. And so what we need is materials which will soak up the hydrogen quickly because I don't want to stand at the tank for half an hour pumping. Um, and then the materials need to be able to release that hydrogen on demand as needed by the fuel cell uh, when you're driving the car. You've got to get enough in there to last you about 300 odd kilometers as a, as a typical petrol tank would. Otherwise, the public won't accept it. Um, and so this is a really big deal. A lot of work went into this in the 2000s decade. It was George Bush Jr.'s big scientific push to the hydrogen economy. And they set criteria that you needed to achieve 
for these storage materials. Um, obviously, you need a high storage capacity, 6.5 weight percent. It's very well known and has been known for decades that heavy metals like platinum or titanium can very easily absorb lots of hydrogen. But they're so heavy, you're going to have a half a ton tank, and that's not good, right? So you can't do that. We've got to look at the top of the periodic table, the light elements, and make materials that will soak up hydrogen. Um, so it's got to be light, otherwise you don't get the weight percent you need. Um, the other thing is you've got to get the hydrogen off again within this temperature range. Otherwise, it's not feasible within the engine to do that, within the, the car mechanism to do this. Um, you need good reversibility. It's got to be non-toxic, non-explosive, low cost, low weight, no pressure. Um, and so there was a finite political timeline on achieving this, which the scientists couldn't do. They worked really, really hard. A lot of people tried. Um, then we had a change of government. Obama came in, needed his own new initiative, and went to batteries. But hydrogen is still exceedingly important. Europe has continued to push it. Um, and hydrogen or batteries, they're both going to eventually make up the mix that will solve our challenges. So we need this kind of thing. And I want to tell you briefly about what we did back at UQ. We didn't solve the problems. Uh, but it raises to you the problems in mind that need to be solved. We were looking at magnesium hydride, because it's a light metal, right? So a light metal hydride. 7.6 weight percent, um, which is fine. It's lightweight, it's low cost, it's easy to make, it should be very good. The first problem you run into with magnesium is terribly slow kinetics uh, to get the hydrogen in. And the reason is, we did the calculations to show it, if you put H2 molecule on a magnesium surface, there's an enormous barrier, 1 EV, 25 odd kilocalories worth, to break that H2 bond. H2 in the gas phase, I have to stress, is a molecule, not an atom. It's H2 molecule, and that bond is strong, that's why it's a good fuel. It's got a lot of energy locked up in it, right? Um, but you, if you want to get it into a magnesium hydride or a light metal hydride, it's atomic hydrogen that's in there. So you've got to split that bond first and then get the atoms down into the metal, okay? And that's the problem. You can't do it on magnesium. So what do you do? You dope it with a low percentage of these transition metals, which I told you are really good at splitting H2 bonds. So they tried putting in titanium for a start, something cheap, right? And it sort of works, but not all that well. And we first of all ran calculations to show why it sort of works. And here's what happens when you put H2 molecule on a magnesium surface with a titanium atom in there, OK? Um, it rocks on in. It loves to bind to the titanium. We've got molecular hydrogen here, little tiny barrier, split the bond. Down you go, boom. Now you've got 200 atoms sitting on either side of the titanium. Well, that's great. We published that real quick because it shows this nice catalytic behavior of titanium to load hydrogen into magnesium. There's still a problem. Um, if you think what happens next, I've got to take that hydrogen and I've got to move it over the surface so it can get down into the metal, right? What happens when you do that? Um, this happens. So we were down here, but if I try and pull the hydrogen atom away from the titanium, whoops. I hit another 1 EV barrier. It binds too strongly and holds it too tight. And so this is a classic catalysis lesson. Catalysis is kind of like a Goldilocks thing. Enough binding to activate the bond, but not too strong binding, or you're going to lock it up and nothing happens. All right? Um, and so what happens with straight up titanium is you get this situation where hydrogen piles up on the titanium, and it's not going anywhere. OK, so what our experimental colleagues did was to throw in other stuff as well and have a cocktail of dopants. And they did ultimately solve the kinetic challenge of getting the hydrogen in. That was fine, nice weight percent, pretty fast. That was good. But where it stalled was that they couldn't get it out again at a low enough temperature. If you look at magnesium hydride, the intrinsic bond strength of atomic hydrogen to magnesium is too strong. You've got to heat that thing up to several hundred degrees Celsius to get the hydrogen out again, back to this Goldilocks problem, all right? And so that's where I left it, because I went on to do other things. Um, but we're coming back onto hydrogen in a big, in, in a big way uh, here at UNSW. Went to Oak Ridge, as I've mentioned already. Uh, lovely big nanoscience center, which has everything under one roof. All kind of synthetic methods, physical deposition methods, wet chemical methods, nanofabrication, the whole deal. Um, another thing about Oak Ridge, it's in the middle of nowhere. Here's the sky view of Oak Ridge National Lab. And so we are up here. This is the nanocenter joined to the Spallation Neutron Source, the world's largest uh, neutron source, multi-billion dollar investment, um, up on the ridge. 
And to go to meetings, I had to drive 10 minutes down the hill to the main campus here, middle of nowhere. But amazing infrastructure, absolutely staggering. The amount of infrastructure they've got there and the multidisciplinary uh, capabilities under one roof. So my colleague called me up when I was at UQ one time and said, well, we're looking for a new director for this place. I thought, oh, it sounds all right, I'll get a free trip. You know? So I went over, put my CV in, and went, took a year, multi-stage competitive interviewing thing. In the end, they offered me the job. I couldn't believe it. Well, I should say I expected it, you know, but I didn't really. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, and I couldn't turn it down. It was just too good. Uh, the chances of being able to run scale at that size and help these different groups to integrate what they were doing and kick goals they never could do before was just too much. So I took the centre through one three-year cycle. They have a, every three years they do a huge external review, massive exercise. Uh, we did that in 2013, um, the best review they've ever done, and they came out number one in all five centres uh, around the US. So it was a tremendous learning experience. Um, as you might guess, an awful lot of politics um, I'm an academic at heart, uh, and so I knew after a year or so that I probably was going to go back into academia, but it was a fantastic experience, and it influenced my, my philosophy about how to drive materials discovery quite profoundly. Um, so they had all this stuff under one roof, I told you, whoops, sorry, all this stuff under one roof, um, including, and I want to highlight this, including a large theory group, because Oak Ridge is three things. It's neutrons. It's materials research and it's computing. They have the world's largest or second largest flip-flops with China uh, supercomputing facility. Um, they used to use all that power for isotope separation in the nuclear program because Oak Ridge was a, an integral part of the nuclear program. And in fact, Oak Ridge as a town was not on the map before 1975, hence it's called the Secret City as a nickname. Um, but these days, when they had to repurpose it and move out of uh, uh, all the nuclear, he heavy nuclear stuff, what are they going to do with all that power? They use it for supercomputing now. So when you, want it, when you get to the airport at Knoxville, drive out of Knoxville, you're heading to Oak Ridge, how do you find the lab? Just follow the power lines. It's phenomenal. Um, so anyway, they've got a theory group in a user facility. Quite a remarkable innovation for the DOE. Uh, and as far as I know, the US is the only place that's doing this. They have, and so these guys, they also service users. They, you can apply from anywhere in the world to use their equipment and to use, have computation backing it up to achieve your vision for what you want to do. Think about what that means for an early career faculty member who's got no gear yet in the lab. This can get them off the ground, and it does. Um, and so it's a tremendous benefit for the broader community. But I want to highlight that theory and computation is an intrinsic and very important part of the whole deal. We don't have that in Australia at this point, and I think it's something that we should think about. Um, more science uh, before we wrap this thing up. This is about CO2 gas capture. And I've talked to you about this Goldilocks problem with the hydrogen storage. It's the same problem with CO2. We need to capture CO2 out of, um, we need to capture CO2 out of the uh, uh, exhaust flue of power stations that are burning coal, all right? Um, and so we need materials that can grab it, um, but ideally materials that can release it again on demand when we need to then sequester it or catalytically transform it to fuels or, or methanol or whatever. Um, and I had a conversation with this Professor Sang Kyun Kim at Seoul National back in 2009. He told me about this beautiful experiment where he takes an azobenzene molecule, he makes a molecular beam under high vacuum, and he bleeds in CO2 and uses a laser to probe the complexation. Very weak van der Waals cluster, not much going on there. Then he seeds in electrons. Um, and suddenly, the, the, the signal in his laser goes crazy. He's got a complete change in bonding. And so suddenly, when you add an electron to that system, it grabs the CO2 and binds it chemically on the order of one to two EVs. A lot of binding, just for an electron. So I got very excited about this because we work with carbon materials like this all the time, and we know we can dope them, and we can get these kinds of pyridinic nitrogen defects. So couldn't we then just charge up our material and grab CO2 at will? and then switch the voltage and release it. Would be nice if we could. So we did calculations and showed that indeed you can make, in, in principle, you can make this happen. So we model a little section of a nanotube. It's a periodic boundary condition, so in principle it goes forever. But we just model this little part here and do the electronic structure calculations. We add one electron, nothing much happening, two, three, and suddenly you cross a threshold and boom, it grabs the CO2 and binds it strongly. 
So there's something going on electrocatalytically here to bind the CO2. And the beautiful thing is, if we can make this work, then we have a mechanism for circumventing the thermochemistry. We, we, we control it with the voltage. Um, so a nice idea in principle. It's selective. It binds CO2 and not nitrogen. Very important. Uh, we published this, and former group members of mine at UQ then found that you could do a similar thing with boron nitride, hexagonal boron nitride. The nice thing about this, this is like graphene, but it's BN, 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 instead of carbon rings, all right? The nice thing about this is it's, uh, it's got lots of boron atoms combined, so you could load up a whole monolayer in principle on this thing. The problem is you've got to charge it. Boron nitride has about a 5 EV band gap, which means all the electrons down here, if you want to put any more charge in, you're going to have to climb all the way up there, 5 EV worth. It costs too much energy. So we need uh, to look at new materials. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we had and found a material, theoretically, let's say, um, which could bind either hydrogen or CO2 under charging. Good conductivity, excellent capacity, yada, yada, yada. Um, well, that sounds exciting. Uh, but one of the questions then is, well, you tell me you put this much charge in your little tiny supercell here and you get a binding effect. What does that mean in terms of an experimental voltage? Till last year, we had no idea because the theory did not exist to make the bridge between this little model that we calculate and a real electrochemical experiment. We built that theory in the last few months. Um, I'm not going to tell you any more at this point, or else my commercialization manager, Emma Elliott, who's in the audience, uh, will shoot me. But I've got to stop there and say it's exciting times. Um, we have set up the Integrated Materials Design Center at UQ. Um, a lot has been said already about this necessary synthesis between computation and synthesis and characterization and materials testing. That's the only way you're truly going to accelerate materials discovery. And so it's a computational center, but integrated should be a big eye twice the size because it's the synergies between which are really going to make this uh, uh, do great things. We've built our research programs around areas where we know there is massive experimental strength here at UNSW. And our model is that we have core members who have real skin in the game of modeling, but we also have exceedingly highly valued experimental collaborators in these areas with whom we hope to build the science and build the materials discovery. Uh, so that's the uh, modus operandi, if you will, of the, of the center. It's this fusion of high-performance computing, which is truly a game changer in materials discovery. Nothing else is changing at the same rate as computing capacity and the capacity of theory to simulate materials at the atomic level. Um, and then all of the other things that go in crucially into this. Whoops, I've lost it. Um, thanks to Les Field's support and Mark Hoffman's as PVC Research, we have support to bring in a wonderful team of young investigators who are firing on all cylinders now. I want to thank Vicky Chen also, the head of my school, who supported us strongly. Um, and uh, that's it. Um, do we have the capacity, the grunt, to achieve it? Mostly, not completely. We have tremendous support from NCI and Pawsey Institutes, we have built up some in-house capacity here at UNSW, thanks to Mark in engineering uh, and Graham Davies. Um, and when we need to go outside, we do, uh, using the facilities at Oak Ridge. Um, that's been a long journey then, from the snow-capped mountains of Christchurch to the snow-capped waves of Marubra. Uh, it's been made all the more fun and feasible through uh, having my companions, Mei Yun, and these two ragamuffins, Ralph and Ethan. Um, who give us lots of worry and stress, but lots of joy and pride as well. Thank you. As our VC said, the, the purpose of this was a, a celebration of achievements. And I have to say, Sean, it's a, it's a true celebration of your achievements. We've traveled, we've started in Christchurch, we went to Sydney, and we then went to Göttingen and to Berkeley. We've travelled a fair bit. It was actually, I was just looking through your CV and realised that Sean and I actually overlapped in Berkeley. And I reflected on that and I sort of thought, well, we didn't meet. And it's probably because Sean was smoking pot and everything while I was working hard. <laughs> and then I've realised that Mei Yun went with him and he talked about us so much that I oh, probably had to reflect a bit on the reality and it might have been the opposite, Sean. <laughs> um, then from Berkeley, you went to Brisbane, came to Australia, came back to, came back to Australia, then went back to Göttingen, then went back to the US, 
And now you're back in Australia, and all I want to say is it's no need to go all the way back to New Zealand now. <laughs> It's been quite a geographical talk. We've sort of, we've heard of saddle points, reactant valleys, but then it gets quite philosophical where we're hearing about unstable excitement and transition states. And then I suddenly thought, of, brought up a term there that sort of comes a lot into, into my days. Effective catalysis is a delicate state, which I think actually says a lot, it's a very philosophical. But what I really want to point out with what, what Sean has actually done is he started off with very theoretical work. I have to say that differential equation you showed, I was somewhat daunted and I thought, here we go, Mark's going to lose track of this talk. But then it, you, it just kept on going because what you've managed to do is take that really, that fundamental capability, move it into computation and then address some of the profound problems that we have in the world today. You've talked quite extensively about hydrogen storage and CO2 capture, and then also the whole idea of putting genetic material into cells. And what Sean's actually doing is, when I first met Sean, I, I realised this, he's actually at the vanguard and moving forward to where science is now, where we're actually taking computational power and actually using it to design materials at the, at the fundamental level. And I have to say, Sean, that it was particularly pleasing. I think it was my last act as PVC research was to sign off on that centre because I think Sean's got this amazing capability to do that. We've got to expect great things and it's certainly been today a celebration of some great achievements. Well done, Sean. <laughs> Wow, what a wonderful lecture. Um, I, I wrote down quite a few things uh, during Sean's talk. Chemistry, cell therapy, hydrogen storage, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide capture, um, internationalization, partnership in science, family, um, mentorship, organization of science, collaboration, some wonderful things. Um, it really was a, a fantastic lecture and everything that we were looking for in these inaugural lectures. I, I, the, the, all, so many memorable things. I was left with one particular thing, and that was this thing about the asking for permission to marry. <laughs> and and, and I, um, I've decided that tomorrow I will announce to the university <laughs> that if you want to marry, I will ask you to get my permission in writing. <laughs> forthwith. Um, Sean, that was a, a truly memorable lecture. I, I want you to come up here, standing in front of this great picture of uh, Christchurch, the waves in Sydney and your family. If you could just come here one more time so that we can give you one last, very large round of applause. <laughs>